everybody for being here today. Um, thank you, all fellow readers and panelists. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And I have to apologize in advance if I'm coughing and sneezing throughout this. I'm recovering from a cold, but uh, very happy to be here with you. Um, and it's great to be in Little Tokyo and at the Japanese American National Museum. Uh, this place is very dear to me. Uh, there's scenes in my last two books that are set uh, right in this block, essentially. Um, and I've always been interested in writing about communities that are uh, mixed race historically. Um, and actually, Little Tokyo is one of those, because even though it was predominantly Japanese American, it always has had a significant both Mexican American and African American uh, population as well. And uh, for those history nerds out there, during World War II, this neighborhood completely emptied of Japanese Americans because of the internment and was filled with southern black migrants who came to work here uh, uh, in the war industry, um, in the shipyards and places, and was called Bronzeville for a while. So really interesting history. Um, this new book, however, is, is my first one is not set in LA. It's uh, set in rural Wisconsin. And it deals with a young uh, half-Japanese kid named Michelle, uh, better known as Mikey, who's living with her uh, grandparents in this very small, homogeneous white town. And it deals both with her difficulties of being other in this, uh, in this very white place, but also the joys of her relationship with her grandfather, Charlie, and living in the, the countryside. And this grandfather uh, is, is both um, uh, a, a, frankly, a bigoted guy who was so disapproving of his son's marriage that he wouldn't go to the wedding, uh, but then ultimately becomes her great hero and protector and nurturer. Um, and uh, the, the book uh, also then copes, uh, deals with a young black couple who moves into town, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Garrett, who moved uh, there to become a nurse and, a, and an elementary school teacher. <laughs> and all the hatred that had been placed on Mikey um, for, for being uh, half Japanese is basically lifted off of her and put onto this, this couple. Uh, and the charge to move them out of town uh, is led essentially by the beloved grandfather, uh, who does not get the contradiction between how he's treating this couple and his own unconditional love for his own uh, ch uh, grandchild of color. So that's the setup. I'm going to read you one scene from uh, kind of the middle of the book. And this is after the Garretts have moved to town. Um, Mr. Garrett's working in the school. And it's basically the story of two young boys. Uh, one is a boy named Billy Coles, and the other boy uh, shows up at the end of the section. His name is Kevin Watson. By the time I made it out to the playground, Missy Calloway was sitting on my usual bench with Jessica Brown. I continued past them, beyond the kids playing handball and hopscotch, and headed for my second favorite spot. There was another wooden bench around the corner of the building toward the front of the school. This square area of concrete, to the right of the swings, did not have any grass or equipment, and because there was nothing to play with, it was usually empty. I like to sit on that bench sometimes, away from everyone else, and lean my back against the wall. This physical distance made me less self-conscious about being alone. At least here, out of sight, I wouldn't get teased for it. But if someone approached me in a way that seemed like trouble, I could just slip around the corner, back in view of the teachers. On this morning, though, when I turned the corner, my usual space wasn't empty. Several boys had surrounded another boy I recognized as Billy Coles, one of the children from the trailers in the country. He was sitting on the bench, back pressed flat against the wall, the four other boys standing around him in a semicircle. One of them was leaning over him, finger pointing in his face. Billy kept trying to back up, but there was nowhere to go, so he just slipped a little further down the wall. He looked scared and his eyes were darting between the other boys' bodies, looking for a path of escape. Other than me, Billy was the most unpopular child at school. He had dirty blonde hair that was jaggedly cut with a ponytail half a foot long. His face and clothes were often streaked with dirt, and his shoelaces were always knotted and plumped where they had broken and been tied back together. His fingernails were always dirty, and his nose often ran. I'd seen teachers recoil physically when they had to touch him. Billy had several equally dirty brothers and sisters whom I sometimes saw in town, at the ice cream parlor, or the movies, or in the grocery store, anywhere businesses were giving something away for free. His mother was a small, silent woman who came to the market to buy groceries with food stamps. His father was tall and skinny, with tied back hair as long as Billy's. I sometimes saw him picking through garbage cans on the outskirts of town, and we both turned our heads away, embarrassed. Billy was not the only child at school from the country trailers. Once a week, a group of them were marched into the gym for a bath. 
But because he butted heads with the kids from town, he was the one who drew the most attention. I never particularly liked him myself, but right then I wanted to say, just slip around the corner. Turn to the left and you'll be safe. You stink, Billy, said the boy who was leaning over him, and I saw that it was Dale Davis, the police chief's son. Dale was usually a decent boy and not a known bully. Why don't you go take a bath or something? He don't have a bathtub, Dale, said another boy, Walter. He's got to take him here. Oh, that's right, Dale said, as if this was news to him. You don't have a bathtub or a car or even a bedroom, ain't that right? Hell, if it wasn't for the bus that brought you to school, we wouldn't even know you were out there. Billy grimaced, as if these words were a physical assault. Leave me alone, Dale, he said miserably. You want me to leave you alone, huh, said Dale, standing up straight and crossing his arms. I'll bet you didn't tell that nurse to leave you alone. Now I understood. Dale usually didn't bother the country children, or any of the outcasts really, but he'd been listening to his father. And his father knew that people had started going to the clinic. Billy looked up at him now, and his expression neither confirmed nor denied Dale's suspicion. Still, Dale stepped in close again.